Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from Cross Examined, Frank Turek's ministry. He does love posting videos from the Q&A sections of his talks. In this one, he's asked about potential errors in the Bible. And by errors, I don't mean historical errors, of which there are many, but rather transcription errors between different manuscripts. So let's take a look! How do you account for the errors of the scribes um, when the New Testament was handed down person to person? I'm not entirely sure what Frank's position on biblical inerrancy is, though I can infer from other videos of his that I've covered that he does believe the Bible to be inerrant. So even if they're right, it doesn't affect whether or not Christianity is true. It might create problems for biblical inerrancy in the Old Testament, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't exist or Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So that's a really good question. If the Bible is inerrant, then that should include being free of errors from spelling or copying mistakes as well. If the all-powerful God of the universe got the first person to write down exactly what he wanted error-free, then surely he could also have made sure the people copying off that first person's document made accurate copies. And if not, then how do we know that the original was inerrant? Maybe the original authors made mistakes in transcribing what God was telling them to write. Either that, or after God gave the originals, he just stopped caring about accuracy. Yeah, excellent question. There are errors that we know about. Why? Okay, there you go. The Bible is not inerrant. Otherwise, there would not be any errors. By definition. Case closed. Because we can compare the documents, we can compare the manuscripts and see where the errors are. Well, not so fast there, Sparky. We can compare documents and manuscripts to find out where the errors likely were, but we don't actually have the originals, so there will always be a degree of uncertainty. The general rule of thumb is that the earlier manuscripts are more likely to be accurate if there's a disagreement with the later manuscripts, because as more time passes, more errors, changes, additions, and omissions have time to work their way into the text. We can also look at other writings from the time, such as from the early church leaders. If they are trying to make a point that would be assisted by an appeal to a specific verse, or would be entirely refuted by a specific verse, but they never mention that verse, then that shows a lack of awareness of that verse, suggesting that it either didn't exist or was altered in a way that changed its meaning. Or on the flip side, if they are clearly referencing a verse that is being argued wasn't in the originals, that can be used as evidence that it was. But it's not as simple as just comparing a few different manuscripts. In fact, let me see if I can show you a representation of that, because it's better seen uh, than it is described. Here it is. Let's say you have, here's the original, which we don't have. We don't, at least we, we we don't think we have any original documents, okay? No, we know that we don't have the originals. The oldest manuscript we have from any canonical biblical text is P52, for which there is some disagreement about its date. The earliest dates place it at 100 CE, 70 or so years after Jesus' death, which actually fits right into the typical 90 to 110 CE range for when John was completed. So as unlikely as it is, maybe this one credit card sized fragment of a manuscript is an original writing. But that's the earliest one that we have, so if any manuscripts from any of the rest of the New Testament were original, that would place their authorship significantly later than the apologists would like. And of course the scholarly consensus on the matter has the other Gospels being written before John, so the fact that the oldest manuscript we have is from the book of John makes it pretty much impossible to have any original manuscripts from any pre-John books, meaning no other Gospels, or for that matter any of Paul's works, maybe the book of 2 Peter. Anyway. Your phrasing there seemed to be designed to imply that it is possible that we have at least some original texts, but we just don't know it. And that simply is not the case, and cannot be the case unless we drastically rework the timeline of authorship of the Bible. And even then, the originals we have would be tiny scraps, not entire books. Hell, the oldest manuscript we have from the book of Mark is a 4.4 centimeter by 4 centimeter scrap from chapter 1 that dates to about 150 to 250 CE. If you want to call that original, then sure, Mark was written more than a century after Jesus' death and couldn't possibly be a direct recounting by an eyewitness or even a secondhand account based on the report of an eyewitness. So they're all copies, okay? Uh, and let's say you find four different copies, and in the first copy you see an error right here. 
And then uh, another copy, there's another error right there. In the third copy, there's another error right there. And in the fourth copy, there's an error right there. Can you reconstruct the original? Maybe. For those listening on the podcast, he's got four copies of the same verse up. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. But for each one, there's a different letter of the word just replaced with a number sign, or hashtag for you youngins. So the easiest conclusion is that the word in question is just. But that is not necessarily the case. Did each of these copies directly copy the original, or were they copies of copies? In the vast majority of cases, they would be copies of copies. So if the first copy had an error, then all subsequent copies would at least have that same error or potentially compound it. So in this case, perhaps the original said, God is Justin and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's just two more letters and a comma, and it completely changes the meaning of the verse. If the first copy was written by someone who didn't like Justin, then he could just omit those three characters and the whole text's meaning is changed. And now other people copy off of him and include that omission, but make one other mistake in addition to it. So yeah, we can be fairly certain from the rest of the text of the Bible that Justin was not considered to be a god by the early Christians. So we can dismiss this claim as being entirely unevidenced. Not to mention it wouldn't translate the same into the Greek, but that's not the point. The point is, we don't know what changed changes the first copyists made, and we don't know what downstream effects would have resulted from that, and the manuscripts are so sparse for the first few hundred years that we can't be certain that there weren't competing copies out there that we just don't know about. Yes, and that's what scholars do. The original, this happens to be Romans, 6, or Romans 3.26, God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now the note here is the New Testament documents have far fewer variations than this example. Well, that depends on which verses we're looking at. For the most part, I agree. The manuscripts we have are likely reasonably faithful to the originals. We don't really have reason to believe otherwise in most cases. However, there are a few notable examples that are quite significant, like the ending of Mark. The oldest manuscripts we have that cover that section of Mark end at chapter 16, verse 8, leaving it on an empty tomb and scared women who tell no one of what they saw. But we have plenty of different manuscripts with different endings or mixtures of endings tacked on to the end of Mark. It is possible that Mark did not actually end at verse 8 and we've lost the original to history, but the scholarly consensus over the last 50 years tend to lean toward that just being the final ending. But no matter what, the verses that are commonly found after verse 8 are certainly not original original to Mark. It's written in a completely different style, using language that Mark actively avoided through the rest of the book. Now, the long ending does have some early attestation. Irenaeus referenced it in 185 CE, and it's possible that Justin Martyr referenced it in 155 CE. And Justin was God, according to the verse that we looked at earlier, so there you go. But the best and earliest manuscripts that we have of the New Testament do not include it, nor do the oldest Georgian manuscripts, the Sinaitic Syrica, about a hundred Armenian manuscripts, and all but one manuscript of the Sahidic Coptic. When the long ending does appear, it often has scribal notes accompanying it, indicating that there are competing manuscripts that they were working from, some containing the verses, others not. And then, in some of these manuscripts, the long ending is preceded by what is called the short ending, a proclamation that the women told Peter and then Jesus sent them out into the world to spread the message. But this particular aspect of the ending is well known to be a late addition. And I could keep going on this. I've barely scratched the surface of the reasoning that Joel Marcus gave in the Anchor Bible translation of Mark for leaving out the long ending. And the Anchor Bible translation is one that often has apologetics built into their reasoning. So if they decide to leave it out as not a part of Mark, then the evidence must be overwhelming. And don't take that as a bash against the Anchor Bible, it is an excellent translation. They give good reasons for choosing the words that they do, but I have noticed in their Genesis book that there are certain spots where they do bake apologetics into their reasoning to a certain degree, but they don't appear to let the apologetics compromise the translation, rather giving an appropriate translation and then explaining why an apologetic might disagree with them. So yes, sometimes scribe made mistakes, but in virtually all cases we know what the mistake was and we can correct it by comparing it with other documents. In most cases, yes. But in the cases where you can't, there are glaring changes that can have a significant impact on how a church's theology could operate. Back to the ending of Mark, there are entire churches built around snake handling, which comes directly from Mark 16, 18. People have died in these churches for a Bible verse that is almost certainly not part of the original book. 
This is also where the Great Commission comes from, that it is the Christian's duty to spread the word throughout the world. This verse has fueled mission trips, some ending in disaster. So a lot of harm has potentially been done as a direct result of this ending being included in the canonized version of Mark. This makes the label of inerrant seem that much more questionable at this point. Now, you might say, why wouldn't God just, if this is true, why wouldn't he just maintain the original? I'm speculating here, but I think one reason, well, two reasons. Number one, if we had the original, we might venerate it. We tend to venerate things like that, right? You telling me Christians don't venerate the Bible? I mean, sure, most don't read it, but how many Facebook posts have you seen praising Jesus because there was a horrible fire that destroyed someone's home or church or something, but their Bible made it through unscathed? In fact, there's a 150-year-old Bible that has survived not one, but two churches burning down around it. And the people call that a work of God. It was a horrible fire destroying everything, but a book survived. Praise God. Never mind the cost of damage or any of the other numerous Bibles that were no doubt in the church that did not survive the fire. But one of the books did survive. Oh yeah, and also this old book is so damaged that it cannot be safely opened anymore. But it survived the fire! It's a miracle! So... God allowed mistakes into his inerrant book to prevent people from venerating it and failed because people venerate it anyway. But number two, if I had the original, what could I do to it? I could alter it, right? Well, I don't think erasers had been invented yet, so in order to alter it directly, you would have to make obvious changes to it. A better way to alter it would be to, you know, copy it and just make the changes that you want. But if you had a copy, 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 and I had a copy, and I changed my copy, is everyone going to know who changed their copy? Not if you were the first to change it and nobody else had access to the original to double-check it. Yeah, because when you get all your copies together and compare it to mine, you go, Turk, you heretic, why'd you do that? Except, even in your own example, every copy was different. So how do you know who made the first change? Take Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, for instance. A scribe copied it out and changed the word upholding to revealing in what appears to be an attempt to alter the meaning of the text. Upholding the universe is a God the Father kind of job, so having Jesus do it is wrong, whereas revealing the universe is a much more Jesus-y job. And in the Greek, it's only a difference of two letters being inserted. Two little letters, and it significantly changes the meaning of the text. We know about this one because the scribe got caught and was reprimanded in the margin, but what if the original text was revealing, and the first person to copy it changed it to upholding? How would we know? No, I am not suggesting that this has actually happened, but the fact that it is possible brings significant doubt into how much we should trust what the Bible says. Right, so by not preserving the original, you actually are able to preserve the original better. Wow, that is some USDA Prime doublespeak right there. Let's hear that again for good measure. Right, so by not preserving the original, you actually are able to preserve the original better. Okay, it's still bad. Like, no, that's not how preservation works. If you preserve the original, then the original is preserved. Because that's how words work. I can't believe I have to explain this, but if we had the original and we knew it was the original, then you can compare the copies directly to the original to see whether or not they match up. And if they don't, then you can see where they don't. You're acting as though the ancient Greek writers of the New Testament had access to some technology that would allow them to directly alter the original text in a way that is completely undetectable. I don't think that they did. My understanding is that basically the only erasing method they used was to just wash an entire sheet of parchment, which still leaves signs of the presence of the original writings. Maybe they had other methods, but I doubt they were completely undetectable. And yes, I am aware that sometimes in the process of digitally storing an original document that is old, the process of scanning it can damage it and potentially destroy it, or in the cases of magazines and books, you might even have to take them apart. So in that sense, it is possible to argue that destroying the original can better preserve the original, as a digital copy is easier to preserve than an actual original book. But... Clearly, we're not talking about digital information here stored in computers. These are ancient Greek authors. So what if the error is not that simple? Like, what if it's a, it's a, a difference in concept? So, for instance, the story about the adulteress who was brought before Jesus with the Pharisees demanding that he say what should be done, and he answers with the iconic, let he who is without sin cast the first stone line? That's another one that we have good reason to believe was not included in the original, though the case isn't quite as conclusive as with the endings of Mark. It's not in the earliest manuscripts, and it's in a style that doesn't quite fit with the rest of John. 
as well as how do we justify the truth in Jesus' exact words when we didn't hear them ourselves. Exactly. Small changes can make a huge difference in meaning, so how do we know what Jesus' original meaning was in what he said when we don't have original copies of the record of what he said? Okay, there is no significant doctrine, theological doctrine, that is affected by any variant. That we know of. The fact of the matter is that we only have a handful of manuscript fragments from the first few centuries. Who knows what competing traditions were just completely wiped out over time? Well, realistically, we have non-biblical writings that allow us to learn what the early Christians believed, so yeah, it's not likely that these changes would have significantly affected doctrine for the most part, except for a few examples like the aforementioned snake handlers. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not the point of the argument. The point is that God is supposed to be all-powerful. God is supposed to have given us a message in the Bible. People like Frank tend to want this message to be without error. But errors demonstrably exist, both in the contents of the book and in the transmission of the book through the generations. Therefore, the book is not inerrant, and so God either didn't want to get his message across perfectly, or he wasn't able to, or he doesn't exist. In, and who admits this? Bart Ehrman himself. Okay. Ooh, Bart Ehrman himself. Wow. If Bart Ehrman admits it, it has to be true, because he is the final authority on scriptural interpretation. Or rather, he's just the non-Christian scholar who Christians like to reference because he agrees that Jesus was probably based on a real guy. I mean, Ehrman does do good work, sure, but that's just a weird way to refer to him. You know, he wrote the book Misquoting Jesus. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but in 2005 he wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus, a popular book uh, in which he tries to insinuate that we can't trust what the New Testament documents have said. Well, I haven't read the book yet, it's on my list, but according to Wikipedia's summary, he concludes that various early scribes altered the New Testament texts in order to de-emphasize the role of women in the early church, to unify and harmonize the different portrayals of Jesus in the four Gospels, and to oppose certain heresies such as adoptionism. That doesn't say that we can't trust what they have said, rather it is positing that there exists evidence that some of the documents were changed at later times to fit later beliefs and interpretations. And there is evidence of that, some of which I have brought up already. But that's it for this one. He just tries to insist that Ehrman is contradicting himself because he wrote a book about how you can't trust the New Testament documents, but then when he published academically, he says that you can trust the New Testament documents. It's much more nuanced than Frank has made it out to be, and he directly implies that Ehrman is being dishonest for the money that he gets from his book sales. The only thing I can speculate is when you say to the academic community something wrong, they'll correct you on it. But when you say something wrong to the lay community, they don't know any better in most cases. You can sell a lot of books when you say the New Testament documents aren't copied reliably. Which is kind of a slimy tactic in my opinion. Today's comment of the day I'm grabbing from Twitter this time. When I posted Frank's quote about the originals being preserved better because they were not preserved, I explained that the context was with reference to using the changes that were made as a method of reconstructing the original. In response, Fractal Brian said, Odd that Frank Turek believes that differing, varying copies of a sequence can be compared in order to reliably retrace their lineages back to a common source, yet when biologists do the same basic thing with DNA, he still doesn't believe in evolution. Right? He is a young Earth creationist. I'm kind of mad I didn't think of that comparison first. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the copies that allow for the superior preservation of the original that is my channel. If you'd like to be changed in an undetectable way, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. Special thanks to patron Lynn Dobbs, who purchased the Samsung 970 Evo Plus 1TB solid state drive for me. I'm really going to be enjoying that. If you'd like to listen to my video in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! Right? So by not preserving the original, you actually are able to preserve the original better.